The author D.H. Lawrence said, if only we could have two lives, the first one in which to make our mistakes and the second in which to profit from those mistakes. But unfortunately, there are no dress rehearsals for life. We've only got one shot at it. Obviously, you can't change the past. We all make mistakes, we all mess up. But the question is, how can you make the most of the rest of your life? How can you live a life of purpose, one that is truly fulfilling? St. Paul writes, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done for us, the freedom and life that a relationship with God brings, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul says, break with the past. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. By the world, he means the world that has shut God out. One translation puts it like this. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. In other words, dare to be different. I don't, I don't feel pressure to conform. Yes. Most of my life, I guess. Yeah, every day. It depends, like, I mean, the other day I was in a bar, my friend wanted to go to a club, I wanted to go home and sleep. So I went home and slept. When people look at me and I, and I don't feel comfortable, I feel stressful. For me, I don't really have any pressure to fit in anywhere. I do what I do 100% and I'm unshakable. People see you like someone else and they say, yeah, you're acting like him or like that. You just say no and I am who I am. At work, yeah. Before it was with friends. Nowadays, uh, I'm just who I am. All the time I try to change the currents in my life. Most of the times I don't succeed, but it's fine. You know, I learn from, from that. I don't feel the need to conform to anyone. I never want to be different. I always want to blend in, you know. There was a young police officer who was doing his final exams. The first few questions in the paper were relatively easy, but then he got to question four. Question four went like this. You're on patrol when an explosion occurs in the gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and there's an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van, there's a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognize the woman as the wife of your divisional inspector who is at present away in the United States. A passing motorist stops to offer you assistance and you realize that he's a man who's wanted for armed robbery. Suddenly another man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and the shock of the explosion has made the birth imminent. Another man is crying for help having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion and he cannot swim. Describe in a few words what actions you would take. The officer thought for a moment, picked up his pen and wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. There's a lot of pressure in everyday life to mingle with the crowds and kind of blend in for the sake of an easy life, but we're called to be different, to take a different approach. Now being different doesn't mean being weird. You don't have to speak in weird religious language or wear strange clothes. Just be yourself, be authentic. As Oscar Wilde once said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Jesus was the most authentic, most normal person who ever lived. He was the most fully integrated human being. And Paul says, do not conform any longer. In other words, move on from the past, make a clean break. Being yourself is ultimately liberating. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think we have a fear of change. Perhaps you came to Alpha because you saw a change in a friend or a family member. Something about their life seemed attractive and you wanted to find out why. But at the same time, you're thinking, hmm, not sure I want to become like that. What would it mean to make that change? 
God's not going to ask you to leave behind stuff that's good. He wants the very best for your life. He only asks you to leave behind the rubbish in your life so you can take hold of all the treasure he has in store for you. One of the treasures Paul mentions is sincere love. St Paul writes, love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. The literal Greek word is anupokritos, which means without hypocrisy. And that was the word used in Greek plays when the actor wore a mask that was called hypokritos, from which we get the word hypocrite. And I suppose this mask is what we put forward when we don't want people to see who we really are or kind of how we're really feeling. And we do it with our social media profiles. No one puts up a photo of themselves looking terrible. We find the best photo we can find with the best lighting and filters, but it's not always real. And the danger is, if we treat life like this, then our relationships and friendships could end up being very shallow or superficial. But that's not why we were created. We were created for meaningful relationships. And when I finally understood this, I realised that if God can accept me as I am, even though he knows all the worst things about me, then maybe I can accept myself. When you realise that God loves you just as you are, you can drop the mask and be yourself. You can be authentic. And that's what it means to be a human being loved by God. And when that happens, you begin to experience a real connection with other people. And we see this happening in Alpha and the small group as people gradually begin to take their masks down. You know, we often think that we'll impress people with our strengths, but actually we connect with people through our vulnerabilities. And it's when people begin to drop the masks that these amazing deep friendships begin to form. Sincere, authentic love is the opposite of superficial love. It's about being the same in different situations, so being consistent and having integrity. It means saying the same thing about someone, as you'd say, to someone, because sometimes it's tempting to talk about people behind their backs, you know, to gossip about them. Sincere love means looking to give rather than to get. This applies to every area of life, including our sex lives. God is the most wonderful creator and designer. And he's given the most amazing gifts. He's given the gift of marriage and of sex. Sex was God's idea. He's not surprised by it. He's not looking down and thinking, oh my goodness, whatever will they get up to next? Pleasure is God's invention, not the devil's. The devil tries to distort the beautiful things that God creates. And the Bible affirms our sexuality. There's a whole book in the Bible devoted to the subject of love and sex, the delight, contentment, and satisfaction it brings. But the inventor and designer also tells us how this beautiful gift is to be enjoyed to the full. And the biblical context is lifelong commitment within marriage. Jesus quoted the book of Genesis, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. In other words, there's a public act of leaving and a commitment, a gluing together. That's what the Hebrew word means, glued together. It's not just physically and biologically, but emotionally, psychologically, spiritually and socially. And that is the Christian context for this one flesh union to take place. And in this context, there is freedom and enjoyment. It's exciting, thrilling, and beautiful. It's the most positive view of sex and marriage that exists. Actually, it's by far the most romantic view. And it is God's plan. It's God's purpose. And the designer says, here is this beautiful gift. But don't mess it up because you can hurt yourself with this. It's so powerful. There's no such thing as casual sex. Every act affects this one flesh union. I sometimes illustrate this by gluing two pieces of corrugated cardboard together, one with a picture of a man, one with a picture of a woman. If you glue them together and then try and pull them apart, you see the damage it causes, the hurt. All around in our society, we see broken hearts, people who are hurting. God doesn't want you to get hurt. And therefore, he's given us this beautiful picture of how things can be and how things should be. The good news is it's never too late. God loves you. The society that Paul was writing to, like our own society, is one where God's standards were not kept. 
and they'd really messed up and they were hurt and broken. But Paul never condemns them for that. He just says, don't live like this any longer. From now on, live differently. God forgives. This is all about God's love for you. And that's why Jesus died for you, so that the past can be forgiven, so that the past can be wiped clean, so that the scars, if there are scars, can be healed. Jesus wants to restore wholeness to your life and give you a new start. Today can be a new start for you. So there's sincere love. Another treasure is enthusiasm for God. In Romans 12, 11, Paul says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. This means keep your spiritual enthusiasm. What matters is the long term. Um, probably giving something back to society. For me, when I die, I just want to be remembered, pretty much. Well, I want to become a singer. A beautiful wife, some rad kids so I can take surfing. Owning a business. Retire young. <laughs> just a healthy life and a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Getting a family. I do want to, like, help my family out. You know, that's probably, like, get a lot of money and, like, put them in, like, a good place. I want to be rich. I want to be in love all the time. <laughs> That's my dream. I just don't want to have regrets. To know my purpose. A good night's sleep. I hope everyone tries to help each other more. Live hard and die young. As long as I'm happy, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't know if you might have prayed after the last session when there was that opportunity to ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Well, if you did, you may have had an amazing experience of God. Maybe you felt deeply moved as the Holy Spirit touched your heart in a profound way. Maybe you actually found it quite overwhelming. Or perhaps you feel a bit disappointed. You might say, well, I was hoping I'd have this amazing experience, but to be honest, I don't think I felt much at all. Or maybe you're just thinking, I found it really difficult. Maybe you're thinking, I didn't find it easy at all. Maybe you felt like running away. Maybe you did run away. But do you know what? In one sense, it doesn't really matter because feelings will go up and down. And one day you might be feeling great and everything's going really, really well. Then the next day you wake up and you just feel awful. Yeah, and if you wake up on Monday morning feeling terrible after an amazing time this weekend, does that mean that nothing happened? Well, no. It probably just means that you're tired. What matters is your long-term relationship with God. I grew up as an only child. Um, I was the good church kid. At 18, like so many bad cliches, I rebel. Uh, became uh, a nightclub promoter. And over the next 10 years, from uh, about 18 to 28, really climbed up New York's social ladder. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, uh, I had a Rolex, I had a Labrador Retriever, I had a grand piano in my apartment in New York, and I was so unhappy. Something awakened in me, something, I, it was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. There would never be enough girls, there'd never be enough drugs, there'd never be enough parties. I guess it was a fresh look, being able to take a look at faith again with fresh eyes. And I became so compelled by uh, a Jesus who went around serving the poor, who went around looking after others and, and lived a life of integrity. You know, this is a verse uh, in James that I came across that said, true religion is to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. So I was 0 for 2. Uh, not only had I done nothing for the poor in a decade, I literally polluted people for a living. I made this radical, uh, radical life move. I wound up selling all of my possessions. I joined this humanitarian mission, a group of medical doctors, volunteering in West Africa, operating on a huge hospital ship, and I become their photojournalist. I saw a lot of stuff uh, over those two years, and I think the thing that struck me the most was people drinking dirty water. Half of the country didn't even have their most basic need for health met. Half the country didn't have clean water to drink. And when I landed back in New York, I was 30. And this was the issue that I felt so compelled to work on. And Charity Water was definitely birthed out of my faith experience, of, of me returning back to Christ to 
um, to God again. And, it, you know, I believe that the idea of Charity Water is very close to God's heart. I believe the idea of a world where every single person drinks clean water is, is so fluid, is so in line with the heart of, of God, the heart of the Father. Uh, and, and it's an amazing thing to be able to do with, with my work. Over the last nine years, we've raised almost $200 million. Uh, we've helped over 5.5 uh, million people around the world get access to clean water. So we've made a little bit of a dent. Uh, and, and most importantly, the number of people without water has come down from a billion to 660 million. You know, if I look back on it, I think this idea of really trying to serve God through my work, um, you know, has changed everything in my life. But I think, you know, you can do that wherever you are, whether you're a banker, whether you're a florist, um, you can bring, you know, the, the kingdom values that you believe in into your work, into the way that you, you serve your customers, into the way that you lead uh, your team members, uh, into the way that you, um, you support others. Paul says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, this is an act of the will, to offer all of ourselves to God, all of our lives. And that means giving to God our time, our most valuable possession. When someone puts their faith in Jesus, their priorities change. You know, relationships become the most important thing. Relationships with people, but also your relationship with God. Yeah, but giving God all of our time doesn't mean we spend every waking moment reading the Bible and praying. Yeah, investing time communicating with God will transform your relationship with Him. And investing in relationships with other people is also important. You're not supposed to do this thing on your own. Alpha is just one way of keeping meeting together, but then there's also things like church on Sunday. We also give to God our ambitions, but should a Christian be ambitious? Well, Jesus' answer to that question is yes. In fact, Jesus commands us to be ambitious. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be yours as well. In other words, don't make your secondary things your primary ambition. Yeah, so some people make money their primary ambition. But supposing you get to the end of your life and you've accumulated this massive fortune and you get to heaven and you stand before God and God asks, what have you done with your life? And you say, well, I've made all this money. And God says, oh, wow, that's great. That's so useful here. We can play Monopoly. I mean, as a secondary ambition, it's great. If you say, I want to make loads of money because I know that I can use it to help the poor or eradicate disease and make a difference in this world, that's brilliant. It's a great ambition, but just don't make it your primary ambition. It'd be generous. You know, giving to others is so liberating. We give God our time, our money, our ambition, and also our words. And with your words, you can wreck someone's day. You can actually wreck someone's life, but you can also bless people. And it doesn't cost anything, but it can change someone's life. With our mouths, do we put people down or do we encourage them? With our eyes and ears, do we look and listen to stuff that builds us up? And um, with our hands, do we use them to take or to serve? The paradox is that we think that if we do this, we lose our freedom. But actually, it's the way to find our freedom. St. Augustine said, serving God is perfect freedom. That's what I've found. The more that I'm serving God, the freer I feel. But there will also be a cost. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Jesus didn't come to make life easy. He came to make people great. But there will be challenges. There will be the challenge of leaving behind the rubbish in our lives. The rubbish in our lives is rubbish. But it's hard to leave rubbish behind sometimes because we get very attached to it. And that's part of the cost. And then there's the cost of being willing to fly his flag in what can be a hostile environment. So it's Monday morning. You're back at work. And you're standing by the water cooler. And a few of your colleagues are around. And someone comes up to you and says, oh, hi, nice to see you. Uh, how, how was your weekend? You say, oh, well, my weekend was great, thanks so much. Um, oh, really? What did you do? Oh, I, I, <laughs> I went to the country. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, where, where did you go? Oh, it's somewhere down near Chichester. Oh, Chichester, I, I know Chichester. Um, where were you near Chichester? Uh, a place called Brackersham Bay. Oh, Brackersham Bay, oh, I know Brackersham Bay. My, my, my parents live near there. Where, where were you in Brackersham Bay? <laughs> we, were, um, we were in a sort of, you know, it's like, it's called um, Richardson's. It's a sort of, you know, it's a, it's a sort of holiday camp. 
<laughs> you went. You went to. A holiday camp, Richardson, that, that Richardson face for your weekend. What on earth were you doing there? <laughs> oh, well, I'm on, I'm on a course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on a course? What, what kind of course is that? <laughs> oh, well, it's a sort of... <laughs> it's a... Uh, it, uh, it's very difficult to describe. It is kind of like <laughs> it's, it was actually it's 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 called it's it's, it's called an alf course. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you say the alpha course? Uh, uh, the alpha course. I've, I've heard about that. I've seen seen all those billboards and things about the alpha course. The alpha course. What what exactly is the alpha course? I'm really alpha course. What is that? <laughs> well, the alpha course is, um, <laughs> it's, um, how would you describe the alpha course? It's kind of like, um, it, it's, it's basically, it's basically Christian. Ah! <laughs> Here's the good news. They are not going to kill you. <laughs> they may laugh at you, but... That's about as bad as it's going to get in our context. There's some place in the world where they might kill you. Here, that's the worst thing is that they'll laugh at you. But th there may be a cost. Why? Why should we do this? Why should we present our bodies as a living sacrifice? Well, Paul says, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything that God has done for you, Jesus sacrificed his life for you. He loves you so much. He died for you. And our response is to say, Lord, I give you everything. I trust you with everything. I present my body to you as a living sacrifice. And what Paul says is, when you do that, you'll find out what God's will is for your life. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The devil wants to tell you that God is a spoil sport, that he wants to ruin your life. You can't trust him if you present your, your body a living sacrifice. He's going to absolutely ruin it. But Paul says, no, his purpose for you is good. It's pleasing. It will please you. And it's perfect. You cannot improve on God's plan for your life. Because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life in all its fullness. And when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, we discover God's good, pleasing, and perfect plan. We discover life and life in all its fullness, a life of abundance, a life as life is meant to be lived, a life worth living, a life following Jesus. I got in with the wrong crowd and I started to um, pinch cars, burgle houses, uh, become known, me and my friends become known as very high profile thieves really. I used to carry big knives, uh, the, the big knives to the smaller knives down my waist. And I was the kind of person where if you pulled a knife out, I would use it. I ended up stabbing someone in the head. I ended up um, stabbing someone just missing his heart and going through the top of his shoulder, uh, the, the top of his chest and his shoulder away. He dropped to the floor and so I was on the run for two attempted murders. And then I was just, when I went to prison, I had such a hatred for the system and I couldn't handle being told what to do, couldn't handle prison officers mucking me about. When I went out on association, I got to prison officer and I, uh, I stabbed him. And then this led to me going into maximum security prisons, being put on CSC. It's where they feed you through a hatch in the door. There's no physical contact, so they have to have riot shields and riot gear on. Um, and that was my life for a long, long time, basically. And I, I just was going from prison to prison, prison to prison. But then I ended up going to Long Larton in Worcestershire. And when I was in there, I ended up going in an alpha course. Never heard of an alpha course, didn't know anything. And I just remember walking in because they'd sent me down. I sat down on a chair and I thought, oh no, it's a Christian thing. And we'd just go there every week and I would argue. And the pastor, um, I remember he come to me. He said, right, I'm going to say a few scriptures first before we pray. And one of them was, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then he said the verses about Jesus and explained a bit why he died on the cross for sinners and stuff. And then he said, pray. So I started praying and I said, uh, God, 
Say, God, if you're real, come into my life because I hate who I am. And nothing happened. But then, as I was talking to the pastor, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up and raise up. And I just broke out into uncontrollable um, tears. And I just sobbed. <clears throat> and I just... Right there. Because that was a change in my whole life. I knew God was real. Um, and no one will change that now. And then I remember <laughs> running on the wing. People clearly knew that I would become a Christian. So I actually helped them on another two Alpha courses. And then I, I, um, I got released. I've been in a prison where I... Because you would have thought that the prison where I stopped the prison officers would have been the last prison to have me. But they were the first. It's how God works. The best thing for me is going in prisons and helping the lads in prison and, and trying to tell them about God. I've got um, four kids and they're my life. Um, and what upsets me is because now I know um, that back then, if I had the kids, uh, they wouldn't have had a good upbringing. And now they sit on the night and have Bible studies with their dad. Um, <clears throat> A Bible study with a dad, have a life, the beautiful, um, and my life. And this probably is my wife and my kids are the best gift, that, apart from the grace God's given me, is the best gift I've ever, he'll ever give me. Didn't expect to cry like that. Recovered now. <clears throat>